because it is 10 okay. o'clock and it's Lancaster Wood Turner's uh, Thursday morning coffee hour for April, what is it, 21st today? 21st. Uh, I think it's coffee hour number 99, it might be, uh, which yeah. continues to amaze me that we've managed to carry on here every week for two years. Uh, and welcome, everybody. Uh, this morning's a show and tell morning, but before we do that, I'd like to uh, go back to last week for a minute and uh, thank you all for joining in the Jack Vesery presentation. And I'd like to know what you thought of it. If you have any comments, this would be a good time to roll them out. There's certainly stuff that I've never seen before. And I was very, very impressed, especially with the coloring techniques. I love the coloring techniques. I learned a lot from that. Yeah. Yeah. I did too. I was really amazed. So next month uh, in May, who does who would you like to have? Uh, we found that pretty much anybody we invite will come on. Um, and so far, I've been doing the inviting, but I thought I'd put it to the group uh, and see if there's a, any kind of consensus or even a short list that we can work through. I was thinking of asking Al Sturt for one, um, but who who would you guys like to hear from? Hmm. I have to think about. Think on that. Drop me an email or note. I can get Barry Schwager, who of uh, JPW fame, and uh, Dave Hout on anytime you want. I'd like to have Dave Hout one time soon, and also Schwager. Schwager helped design the Parmatic, I believe. Uh, any other nominees coming up right now, I'll take them, but you can also email me or drop me a, a note in the chat. It's all fine. Uh, at the end of the meeting, when, with the recording, the chat is preserved entirely. So, I can, if the chat's got lots of good stuff in it, I can post it as a as a whole thing. Uh, what I often do is pull uh, links that are in the chat and embed them in the videos so that they're just available there in the recording. So, anything you want to pass along, the chat's a good place to do it. It doesn't get lost when the meeting ends. Uh, let's see. Well, today's a show and tell. Um, who'd like to show stuff? We use raise hand. If you'd like to show us stuff, use raise hand so you come to the top of the queue so we know who you are and where you are. Um, I have a few nominees already. I'm going to do a little raise hand myself just so I go to the top of the screen and stay there. Okay. okay. Coleman, David Campbell. Yep. Okay. Can you do raise hand? You got a raise hand? Uh, raise hand? No, I mean raise hand is the right on the reactions tab, the bottom of your screen. Uh, there's a tab called reactions. If you click on that, the big button on it is raise hand, and that raises a virtual hand that pops you up on my screen. Oh, that's new to me. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, I'd like everyone. <laughs> The reason, the reason we started Coffee Hour in the first place back 99 Coffee Hours ago was to get help our guys get up on Zoom and learn Zoom. So it's uh, mm -hmm. we we I feel free to take time in this to uh, do Zoom stuff and and I'm going to as a matter of fact I'm doing a Zoom recording, an unusual recording experiment today. We'll see how that goes. Uh, okay, before I start to go around, uh, go down the list and hear from people. Who uh, has anybody got anything they're dying to say? Any announcements you'd like to make? Hey, John, I think Norbert is trying to get his raised hand. I think he wanted to be up in the row. Is that right, Norbert? Yeah. I was trying to, because the guys want to see my shop. We would like to see your shop. Yeah, but I'd like you to learn raise hand, too. It's good for everybody to oh, know where it is. See, I thought I did. Let me try again. No, it went away. Oh, so if I do that. There you, there go. you go. Oh, that's clap hand. Oh, no. that's oh awesome. hang on, that's hang on. Hearing one. <laughs> that's that's, that's, the, that's, that's applause. Oh, raise raise hand. hand. Oh, so close and yet so far. <laughs> yeah, it's a, there you go. There you go. Okay. I thought, I thought you wanted to be there. Wow. So. <laughs> raise hands very useful because of the screen this size. What do we got on here? Uh, what do I see? No, 49, 43 rather on screen. Um, I do my best to keep track, but I can't always do it, especially when we get people spotlighted. So raise hand allows. Uh, uh, gets gets you in a queue, it brings you to the top okay. of the screen, and it makes it possible to find our way around. Okay. Okay. Um, anybody else like to join the queue? I see there's eight or seven or eight up in there now. Okay. And you can do rejoin at any time. You can also use raise hand to jump into a discussion. We'll spot you. Um, and you can also just <laughs> unmute yourself and jump right on in. Uh, we have muted everybody because somebody had uh, some pretty bad noise going on, and if that comes up, we'll mute everybody again. But you're free to unmute yourself at any time. Um, Ken Vasco, what do you got? What would you like to do today? 
Hang on, I'm unmuting. And I got you spotlighted. All right. Uh, I've been making uh, mushrooms lately. And they've been coming out really well. I'll say. And, uh, I, I have a question on this one. This is cedar. And I was just wondering about the finish. I put spray lacquer on it, and I'm wondering if it's going to be too oily. So if anybody has any, oh. if anybody has any suggestions, uh, is spray lacquer going to work on the cedar? Well, you could always try it and find out. Well, that's what I've got now, but I didn't know if the oils were going to come out and ruin the finish. Is that a one-piece turning? Yes. Yes. Okay, I'll give it a try and get back to you. How's that? Okay, is that it for you? Yep, that's bring it. Those, bring those back though for a second, if you wouldn't mind. <clears throat> uh, I was gonna. Uh, those are are those cedar? What are those? Uh, this He's one is cedar? cedar, and the other one is apricot. And are they one piece or multiple piece turnings? Yeah, no, they're one piece. I just had a bunch of little. I started out. I was just doing some uh, tree trimming out in the in the uh, in the yard, and I saw these fruit ones, and I just started uh, doing the uh, doing them, and I just been having fun with them. Then I found this oblong piece of cedar. They're I, turned wet. Pardon me. Are they wet turnings? Yes, they're wet turnings. And so far, I've been nuking them in the microwave, and they've been working out really well. But you can see this one has a little bit of this one has a little bit of off center to it. Uh huh. So it's been a lot of fun. I've been just just enjoying doing them just just for fun. After you uh, nuke them, what do they taste like? <laughs> <laughs> They're a little dry. <laughs> well, what's what is your nuking schedule though? What do you, what have you been doing? I managed to catch a piece on fire the other week and uh, uh, was a little aggressive with the, the microwave there. Well, I think long and slow is best. I do thirty seconds on and then maybe twenty minutes to half an hour off, and then thirty seconds and half an hour, thirty seconds, half an hour, till it feels a little bit dry or just doesn't. When it's uh, a lot of moisture in it, it's steamy, so it's very hot to the touch. But as the moisture comes out, you you don't get as much heat off of the off of them as you come out. Uh huh. By the steam. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. I did, uh, I did a, a thing with a microwave on a stick like that, and I wasn't paying attention to it, and it actually uh, burnt the inside of the stick. That shocked the hell out of me. <laughs> yeah, you gotta gotta stay attentive. <laughs> okay, um, Jim Bowman, what would you like to show us? I I with getting another lathe for myself. I promised myself I was going to put chisel to wood every day. I have a lot of years to catch up with the rest of you guys because I started serious turning late in life. So I have a few things to show, and uh, we will share my screen, uh, he says very confidently. OK, I, the, the fun I've been having, did I make it large enough, John? Yeah, you're good. I'm good? OK. Yeah. The, I've been having fun with this cherry burl that I got from a local guy. He put, he's a wood um, a tree guy. And so I've been turning, and as you all know, I have a passion for um, imperfect wood. So this was something I turned yesterday out of a little cherry burl. And, and, and it had some uh, rot on the side. Now, I discovered, I gotta show you this one. I discovered one way to discover to know how thick your wall is, turn a piece that has a big void in the side. You can see how, you don't need a laser, you can see it as you go. <laughs> I was having fun with that. I go, hey, this is pretty cool because you never can reach the bottom, you know, and, and I don't have a laser. This is the way it looks from the top. So 
I said, hey, this is pretty cool. I'm going to find imperfect ones and uh, turn them. Well, what um, kind of, when, when you're turning those, what kind of risk do you think you're at from it flying off the lathe? Uh, I don't, you know, I, I switched to, uh, I used to do recesses. Now I go to the, I grab the bo bottom with, um, what do you call it, the tenon or whatever. And I have, I've had pretty good luck. I also don't use a very small tenon. That's part of this, part of what happened on the design here. I don't know. I try not to have a catch. And How big are those pieces? What? Uh, they're about five inches in diameter, about seven tall. I should have measured them more carefully. You know, I have one right here, one of them. Um, so you can see what size it is in relation to my head. The, the other one I want to show you is I turned a little oak bowl. Uh, oak, yeah, it is what it is, but it had a nice little knot in it, which I like. And then I put a piece of leather around it. Well, I got a lot of people really like it. I, I don't know. It was just pretty fun. And then the one last thing. Well, just uh, a sec. Before you go from that one, is the leather in a groove or is it just on the surface? It's in a groove. So and, it is. And it, it requires, and this one, I did something which I won't do again. And if you look carefully on the left-hand side of the image, I sanded over top it because I was having, I was using um, CA glue to put it in. I will put CA glue in the groove and then spray activator on the leather and then push it down in. Well, it don't give you any chance to readjust. But so I sanded it and then oiled it. I was using Mahoney's walnut oil, but I right along here, uh, the <clears throat> leather got scraped. So I won't do that again. I'm gonna work by putting them down better. And is that the seam over there on the right side? Yes, it is. You're sharp looking. Well, I'd like to know how you got the seam. Did you overlap them and cut them with a knife or what? Uh, that's pretty much what I did. Because what happened, obviously, with using CA, once you get it down, it's down. Jeff Hankinson yeah, was, says you ought to use uh, contact cement, and I think he's probably right. Yeah, somebody said spray adhesive, too. Well, you can't control that. Those, and so the I, other thing you want to do is skive the ends. Do you know what I'm saying? Skiving? By uh, skiving? Cutting at an angle? Well, no, you take the actual full surface of the leather and you take a super sharp knife and you basically thin it to an almost non-existent edge, ah. full thickness. You do that on both sides opposite. So then when you overlap, you maintain the same thickness of the leather, but you also then have a very non-noticeable connection. That's and a, a long blue line, line too. A long blue line. Uh, you know, like leather workers and uh, and uh, cobblers, they, that's a typical uh, technique they use. And yeah. uh, when I did prosthetics and orthotics, yeah. in order to put leather on feet, when we did false, uh, we did prosthetic feet, you have to skive the edge of the leather so that it lays down over the contours and just fades into the other uh, uh, skived uh, edge. So- What glue did you use, Norbert? I always use the contact cement. Oh, okay. Always. And I have two coats of contact cement. You use a, the heat gun in between just to dry it down. And the last coat you let set until it, it's tacky. And then you push them together. You know, the other question I have is I, I have a big slab of leather that I cut. I lay a hard metal ruler down and take a real sharp knife. How do you keep the, the backside of the leather has a real fringy effect. How do you keep that cut so that that fringe wanted to pop up in the groove? That was the you, problem. For you cut it from the opposite side. Ah. You take the rough surface up and the smooth surface down. So when your knife blade cuts <laughs> the edge, there is no fringe on left on the edge because the uh, leather goes through a press. They put it under high pressure. To, to finish one side. And uh, so you cut it from the opposite side. That is, thank you. I learned two things, because I'm going to do this more. I got such a response from people. Yeah, it's, I use leather uh, often. Yeah. Uh, one last quick uh, thing, and then I'll get out of here. The, I, have, uh, I have had uh, walnut from the 
lumber yard that that cuts my logs in the lumber. And this is a walnut uh, sca a slab. It's what they cut off the tree first when they start cutting boards. And I've had fun um, working with that. Now it's green and I'm discovering that um, walnut likes to go like that as it dries, which I love. So, but you got to get it together before that happens or you're in trouble. So, well, that's- Is that one piece or two, Jim? I'll have to tell you, it's two. <laughs> I, I, um, I had a little bottom problem, and uh, so I turned. It's it's two pieces. the 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 middle piece I cut a little groove, eighth inch groove, and then set it down on. So there. You, so you you plugged your funnel is what you did. <laughs> yeah, and not only that, I had trouble uh, with the fit because I got a little too aggressive with the chisel. Surprise there. Um, so I used the gr Gorilla Glue that expands, and then I had to take a, a black penny and to mark it out so you don't see it. So. All right, enough okay. of my confessions. I'm out of here. So. Okay, thank you, Jim. <laughs> uh, let's see, uh, Ray, Ray Simmons. I'm going to spotlight you, Ray. You want me to show that picture, though, don't you? Yeah, if you would. Okay, let me see if I, I can... Just... No, I have to figure it out. Let me see. You bring it. You bring it up, and I'll just talk to it. Okay, just a second. Let me get to it. Okay. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to this this young guy here. Um, yep, yeah, this young guy here. Uh, this I just wanted to bring this up. He's on this Rose engine. This was manufactured here in Pennsylvania, and he's using that to do machine turning, he's a watchmaker. And um, I got sent an article that uh, at 23 years old, he, he got into the watchmaking business and he worked uh, in Europe in a couple of different places and decided he's gonna go out on his own. He's now in his own business, 23 years old. His watches, and I, I just bring this up because as turners and stuff that we do, his watchers, you know, they, these, they're very competitive. He has a watch he, that starts out at 6,500 euros, and that uh, compares with a 60,000 euro watch. And I mean, this is mind boggling. And what he's doing here is he's engraving it. There's a, there's a microscope and he's engraving the pattern for the dial. And he's gonna launch in July, a titanium watch for 24,000 euros. And I just bring that up is that's an amazing a young guy getting into this and, and what he can do. And he says he he'll get up four o'clock in the morning. He enjoys it so much and go to work if he wants to. And, but uh, what was interesting is uh, this whole the, the whole apparatus was made right here up by Scranton. So um, where, where is this shop, Ray? Uh, Belgium. He's it's. Uh, He's in Belgium. His name is Bernard Van or Melingen. <coughs> and what he's doing, this work that he's doing is guilloche. There's only 20 to 20 to 30 people in the world that still do this. He used to be pretty common. And it's kind of like old world, you know, and, and it, it's kind of coming back, but it's it's uh, such a talent. And he has the talent. Uh, it's <coughs> unbelievable. But this is this is what they use when they cut. They use a microscope to inspect the cuts because he's using a diamond cutter. Because uh, any defect, when the light hits it, you'll see it. So, uh, but I just wanted to show that that piece of equipment was made here. Uh, you know, I say local because the rest of the stuff is European. That's it. That's all I had. Amazing. Thank you, Ray. Questions for Ray? So that's a uh, Lindo White, uh, David Lindo is the guy who made that machine. And right. he is right there in Pennsylvania, as you know. But he's now working with another guy over just across the border in New York at a place called Plumier, where they have a lot of those old machines. And you can just go see them. And if you join, I don't know how much the membership is, but you can actually go use them to make, uh, make products. So do you guys in the ornamental turning world consider watchmakers to be part of your, your universe? Oh, yeah. yeah 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 they they uh and it, when he when david builds those or his shop builds those 
uh, it doesn't split out. It's not, there's more of the Rose engine work done than at, at Guilloche. Um, but the people that go off there, it's another world at machine turning because uh, they're, when you look at some of their work, I mean, it's mind boggling because you, when you look at that with a, with a microscope, I mean, you can't imagine looking at your own work with microscope and what that's what these guys do on a normal basis. And he says he loses, and there is a high loss rate. He loses about, uh, I don't know, less than five in a hundred. And he, and he looks to do a hundred to 200 watches a year. Um, Amazing. So, but the accuracy, and he says, you know, you go and if you've got, you know, 400 cuts, and you make a mistake, you start over, there is no fixing. Yep. And they're using, you know, they're using, you know, very expensive materials. Amazing. To me, I posted a book, a name of a book called Guilloche by a lady named Kalina Shevlin, who worked in Switzerland at a lot of those watchmakers and now is back in the US doing it. But uh, she wrote this book in 2017 and it's really good about the history and the process there if, you, uh, if you're interested more. Do you Very know good. where in Belgium? No, the uh, uh, article is in French. <laughs> uh, that was like, <laughs> I had a little problem getting that information out of it. So no, I know I, I don't know. <laughs> that would be Southern Belgium then, because if it were in the North, it'd be in, in uh, Flemish or Dutch. But yeah, you know, well, you could, he goes under, his watches are, are Bernie's, uh, B-E-R-N-I-E-S. You probably Google that. Uh, look for Bernie's watches, and uh, you might get a hit on that. Where he, where he's at? Thank you, Ray. Any other questions okay. for Ray? Jeff says you should use Google Translate to learn the name of the town. He's probably right. That works pretty good. Uh, I'm trying to get my cursor back. Okay, Tim Sieber, what do you have today? What would you like to show us? Tim's new here, and I asked him if he would like to give a short introduction. He's also a new turner, so we're not we're we're going to see uh, new work by a new turner. I think here we're looking at. There you go. Well, thank you. Um, I've done woodworking for many years, but the cabinets behind me is all my handiwork. But you can see behind me some turnings. I've done a little bit of everything. I probably. If anything, probably I haven't focused on any one thing. So I've tried some little boxes. Where are this you? This one originally. What, what? Can you see it? Yeah, uh, hold it still. Oh, hold it still rather than waving it around. Yeah. What town are you in? I live in Newport, which is about 25 miles west of Harrisburg. Okay. Newport, PA. Newport, PA, yeah. 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 Can we open that? hold the box still and, and, and open the lid so we can see how you fit the lid? Okay. So the flange goes in there. Yeah, I would do it. Yeah, there you go. Well, now, I did that based on a YouTube video. Okay. Because that's how they did it. What wood is it? Uh, this is a mystery wood to me. I'm lucky enough to have a local... Sawyer, he's 91 and he inherited his business from his father. So he has lots of wood laying around that he's willing to just give me. He, he called this, I think it's elm, but he didn't call it elm. He called it something else. Um, so, so I'm not a, sure. It's a local wood rather than an exotic because someone in the chat saying it looks like mahogany, which it does from here, but I don't think it is. No, I don't, I'm pretty sure it's not mahogany, but it's definitely everything. I mean, he's a local Sawyer. Everything he has, has probably come from the forests of Perry County. Okay. Which doesn't is look like, for the, doesn't look a lot like Elm either, actually. Sapeli. Yeah. What is it? I think it's Sapeli. I think you're okay. guessing. Sapeli. I think you're, you're stabbing in the dark. I don't think you can tell Certainly, looking at the video. I used, um, I had started out by turning pens. So I used just this sort of classic, whatever it's called, doctor something pen uh, finish on it. 
so it made it darker than the you know original wood certainly very nice but so it does not... it it does have the grain of mahogany um i experimented I was experimenting gluing pieces. Hold it, hold it. Stop waving I, it around. Hold it still. I know. I'm trying to find a, I'm trying to get it in frame here. There you go. And it uh, blew apart. Uh, now, why do you think that is? Well, the uh, this is walnut <laughs> and that spalted maple. And the spalted <clears throat> maple probably was a little too soft. Was the shop cold when you glued it? No. No, I have a heat. I'm lucky enough to have a heated shop. Um, and I gave it plenty of time. I had glued it up and gave it... Uh, it probably had a couple days sitting around before I went back to, uh, to turn it. Any advice for Tim? Tim on that? What glue did you use? Uh, standard tight bond wood glue. Type two or three? Uh, actually, I think that was uh, one. Yeah. Type. I usually use type one for two. But it didn't. Yeah, it didn't. The question is how didn't... old was it? What's that? How, the, glue? the question is how old was the glue? No, it was a new bottle of glue. It, it wasn't. A new. See, it okay. didn't. It didn't. It. It didn't give way on the glue joint. It gave way in the spalted maple. In the maple. Yeah. Ah, in the maple. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And like I said, I some of the maple, you know, again, it was a piece that guy gave me. It was uh, some of it was was nice and hard, and some of it was starting to get a little punky. But so I. Like, uh, I'm not sure, but I think you got a, it's got a cross grain too. You got the maple grain, uh, flat grain, and the walnut. Then you're gluing it to end grain. That's not going to get a good, yeah, good a grip. Right. Yeah, that's one of the things I'm learning more and more about is the importance of of grain. And I'll show you my other failure, and then I'll show you what I consider maybe my best success. I had seen on internet about gluing the tenon. And then when you're done, you just take a mallet or something and knock it off. Well, I hit it. I was trying to make a dish just with some letters on. It was supposed to be CV. It was in one of my experiments. Um, but when I hit it, I hit it with the grain, and then it just snapped right with the grain. Yeah. you would. Um, I would think you would want to turn it off rather than knock it off. Well, and that's what I've learned since then. Yes, yet you at least turn it, you at least turn it a little bit inward before you you tap it off. But the video, the guy was doing a couple of them, and every one of them he just hit, and it just popped right off. And so, what glue? Can't always trust those videos, I guess. No, you yeah. can't. There's an awful lot of garbage out there in those videos. What suggestion you use? What's One suggestion that? I would make is to reduce the size of that spigot you put on the base. Oh, okay. Make it shorter. Reduce it to about half the size. You mean in length, not in diameter. In the length. In the length. All right. And okay. I did hollow out. I didn't glue. It's not a solid glue. The, you know, it, it only has maybe a half inch to three quarter inch glue, you know, circumference on it. it it's not glued solid to the center. Yeah. So the way is just to turn it off. Don't knock it off with a mouth. Turn mount. it off. What, what <laughs> you should also turn that in. To reverse it. Use button jaws to reverse it to turn it off. <laughs> uh, okay. That's you helpful. Glue. You what could have turned it on a paper joint as and well. The other thing you get. Yes, you could. Yeah. I've just heard about the paper way. joints, but I haven't had the nerve to try that yet. That but, worked uh, well. They work very, very well. well. Yep, and if you sand or hand plane the base of the board first, put the paper joint on, turn it, knock yeah. it off, you can just sand the glue joint off and you've got a flat bottom. Yeah. Uh, they work, it works very well. A good grocery bag uh, is excellent. It's got to be craft paper. I like uh, uh, bags from our local Heinen supermarket. Yes. They seem yes. to work better than anything else. 
Well, that was going to be my question. What kind of paper? So a good, just a good yeah. brown type of paper bag paper. Right. Well, yeah. David, David Springett uses slick paper out of magazines, and he swears by that. So you know. Ah. It, <laughs> but Lyle one, James uh, one, swears one thing by. You have to be really, one thing you have to be really careful of when you're doing the paper joint is you put your glue on a wood on each side, and don't forget to put the paper in. <laughs> don't don't ah, ask well. me how I know that. That's a big problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is my. After I had the other bowl failure, let me get back here a little. I spent obviously a lot of time gluing. I, my background is mathematics, so I'm fascinated with all the sector angle stuff you can potentially do with uh, turning. Um, a little thick because I was a little gun shy after that other one flew apart. It's good to get to get a, get more experience with it and get and be afraid, because when that, if a thing like that flies apart while you're turning it, you could take a piece in the uh, in the face. Pretty and that can be pretty bad. Yeah. So now, what's the black? Is that a black veneer or an? Uh, that was that was black veneer. Yeah. Huh. So I, Very nice. I nice. cut the little angle sectors. They were. Again, they were 11 and a quarter degree angles. And, and how are you doing that? Cutting those? Yeah. I, uh, I cut those on my chop saw with a, you know, I would experiment. I took some scrap wood and experimented and uh, just till I got the angle just perfect um, to, to cut those. Is the top um, ring one piece? No, the top, that top ring, let's see if I can. No, hold it back. Right you, were, you were better a minute ago. You were, you were better holding it closer to your body. You're too close to the camera. Yeah, better. We can see more now. Okay. Uh, let me spin it and get you dizzy right here. <clears throat> right there's the one seam. So opposite down here. So I cut that, I cut that in, uh, you know, as a in, in its general shape on my bandsaw, and then I glued it on and turned it. So that top piece is two pieces. No, it's you, not, so it's not segments. So so it's going to expand. It's going to expand at different rates than what's below it. Yeah. The, yeah, it has the potential of being a problem going forward for that. Yeah. You know, plus, your uh, the top ring, the the grain is running this way. And then the bottom disc, it's running uh, 90 degrees to that. I did that because visually I like the look of that. So I, I was going to ask you if that was, to do it, but. I was going to ask you if that was deliberate or, or, or random, because I can see it makes sense to do it for the visual look, but it might not be the best for your, you've got some contradictory grain moving on there. Um, but who right, knows? And I, and I, I mean, know that can make a difference. This has been turned, um, probably a month and a half ago and in my house and it's been up in my house and it's been dry from the heat and nothing's happened yet. <laughs> well, all right. Now all of, all of this wood though, this was really dry wood to start with. So it wasn't green. It wasn't even semi green. It was all very dry wood. So hopefully uh -huh. it doesn't have the movement that, you know, you may find more trouble when the, in the humid summer actually. Well, you're, you're right. Yeah. Once it gets humid, it, it might move it. Yeah. Or a couple seasons of a little moving off and on might make a difference over time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like my old, one of my old teachers said, he had no problem with wood movement until somebody taught him about it and then everything came apart. <laughs> well, if it falls apart, I'll let you know next meeting if it suddenly, you know. Yeah, that's fine. And I did, and I think it was the other thing I did do, which I think was wise on my part, I bought this book. I agree with you. Uh, I think, uh, did you see the interview we did with Richard uh, in March, our March uh, feature yes. guest star? Yeah, we had a not very, very entertaining hour and a half with Richard. I yeah. joined that meeting and then I went out and bought the book the next weekend. Good for you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank so, you I very much. Go, I wanna go back and ask the question about this gluing wood to, to uh, objects. Uh, Lyle Jamison swears by using thick CA glue. 
I've tried it two or three times and the I get by about until I have one little poke too hard and then it goes flying across the, and I'm back to Ernie's technique now. I just use craft paper or glue. I have two of them in the shop right now drying and that works. I'm surprised that just works. I said it should not. The CA glue, he says you have to use thick. And I tell you, it don't work. <laughs> Anybody else use CA to glue no. blocks on? No. I just don't trust it. It becomes too crystallized and it's too hard. <laughs> And it splits too easy if you just, it's any stress rises and, uh, and it just comes apart. And, uh, you know, good, reliable wood glue with the paper, that just, you can't knock it. It's been used for years and years, you know. L Lyle says the reason he uses CA is you can break it apart easy. Well, I'd like to, to finish the turning before I break it apart. Before it breaks apart. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I find CA is too brittle for anything. It, uh, Absolutely. It, yeah. It's useful for different that's things, but uh, not for holding anything together that you want to stay together. Yeah, that's what I, yep. I've had good luck using uh, hot melt on some, some yeah. pieces. It works good and then it's easy to be removed. I use hot melt a lot for those things too. Yeah. yeah. I've turned innumerable columns for an architect who's signature is three quarter columns on the corners of kitchen islands. And I put them together uh, with a paper joint in them. And when I'm all done, I just put a chisel in one end and they come right apart. Come apart. And yet yeah. I've never had one come apart. Well, while you're on there, Ernie, why don't you uh, do your show? Well, Ernie and I mm -hmm. had a chat before the, the other day, and he's got a number of things he wants to he'd like to show us, and I haven't heard from Ernie in a while, so go for well, it. Well, in, in this uh, spindle or in this uh, faceplate turning world of the coffee hour, I think it's good to have the uh, spindle turners uh, have some. <laughs> and, and so, uh, for the article I did this time for Woodworkers Journal, I uh, went to a little antique bowling set that my wife bought me in an antique shop so 10 15 years ago and uh made that into an article in which you are instructed how to turn the pin hold the two side by side please uh, the, yeah. the new one and the old one so they, the old ones the old one okay now to so my eye the old one's a little more graceful than the one you made the old one? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've actually slimmed them up a little bit. That was the first one out of the box. And uh, so I've, I've slimmed them a little more. Uh, it, it's, it, it's, you know, the way are they, they are. And are I they, do these. Are, are, they, are they weighted or are they just stand there? They're just hard maple. And how many of them did you make? Ten, of course, for uh, uh, a bowling set. And, and then I show in a video how to turn the balls. The originals actually are oval. Uh, so they were turned from unseasoned wood or 15% maybe when they started out. And the balls were turned between centers. They have flat spots where they were cut off the, uh, the chuck. And uh, so then I showed how two methods of turning the ball in a video and uh also i have for people that are interested this uh Rikon copy of the wolverine jig uh it is if anything better made than the wolverine it has two distinct stops that lock uh this rest is kind of fiddly. And I don't know if you can see it, but it has a link in it here so that it can be raised up and down. And that's great for adjustability, but once you adjust it to your grinder, it doesn't stay that way. And I find that niggling. Are you familiar with the Kodiak jig? Uh, somebody was telling me about how good that one is. I use I'm it. Not. It's phenomenal. Who is that? I have it. Who's, this who's is Norbert. Who, who's saying it? Norbert. 
Norbert. Okay, we'll come to you in a sec, Norbert. It also has this little angle thing that fits in the uh, uh, flat rest, and it wobbles. It it probably has three degrees of error in it. That I was not impressed with. The angle jig is really nice uh, and will handle very big tools, but I actually find it to be a little clunky because the only thing you need this for would be a uh, Texas turning tool, which I don't use. So. so that's the jig, but it is nice. It's not particularly cheaper than the one way either. It's priced very similarly. So, but it is another option out there and the workmanship I would say is quite good on it. What brand is it? Uh, Rikon. <laughs> what do you think about Rikon lathes? Well, uh, I reviewed one of their MIDI lathes so a long time ago, six years ago maybe, and I was quite impressed with it. Uh, Taiwan still has a definite edge on mainland China, but all <laughs> Very serviceable wave, worked well, uh, plenty of power, uh, and the way you hook an extension bed on it uh, is repeatable. You don't have to fiddle with it every time you uh, join it on there, which is a failing of most extension kits for most lathes. Uh, there, I had a chance to fiddle with their really big one. They've come out with the... Uh, That's the gap bed. Yeah, the gap bed, it's uh, their 23 slash 31 swing by where you have the gap and 40 inches between centers. I saw it at a woodcraft show. They were doing a big dog and pony show, so I just sat and didn't say a word and left. But the consensus about of the turning community at that show uh, was that it was kind of a failure. Uh, First of all, yeah, you have 40 inches between centers, but you're down to turning the piece by half in that lathe to get a tool rest under it uh, for most purposes. And uh, the gap was nice. Uh, it, it was the province of pattern makers for years. All old delta lathes had a gap in them to start with, but generally patterns are never, <laughs> thicker than about like that. So you could live with a gap bed, but I, I find that lathe to be built by a bunch of engineers that did it nice mechanically. It's very nice, but they were ignorant of the needs of a turner. So what do you think about the uh, record lathe that started to show up in the US market? I haven't even handled one, so I would pass on that, but Record has a long history and a good bunch of turning engineers, engineers that actually turn themselves. So I would bet that it's pretty good. Their chucks, for instance, are excellent uh, and very reasonably priced. So, uh, but until I turn on one, I would reserve final judgment. Have you seen the Harvey lathe that's been promoted pretty widely? Only online. I've never handled one, but it it is a Taiwan piece uh, of beautiful manufacture from the pictures um, and with some very unique ideas in it. Uh, I would bet that it's pretty good and their biggest one has an impressive between center distance. Uh, I, again, I haven't ever seen one, but there's also the Laguna lathe out there. It's been out there for a while now, quite a while. And it's actually a pretty nice lathe, except for the banjo, which is a split post that you clamp together tighter around the uh, uh, tool rest. So you have trouble putting third party tool rests on that because it requires a very accurate diameter on the tool rest. And even the ones that come with it you really have to reef on that handle to lock the tool rest. And I just find that to be a failure that I will fail the whole lathe over that one. 
<laughs> uh, even, uh, you could order a Powermatic, or I mean, a one-way tool rest with it. They'll build for other people, and they're the best in the world. Uh, there's also Bailey might be made in the same factory, and Bailey is kind of a strange collection of machinery, mainly designed at small industrial and uh, commercial applications, and they were bought by JPW a little over a year ago. So. Uh, there may be some improvements in that line. I have never heard of that line. Um, is anybody on screen uh, any experience with the Harvey lathe? Mm -hmm. mm, okay, looks like it's new to everyone. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Ernie. You're welcome. Take the spotlight off you. Uh, Norbert comes up next. Norbert, I asked Norbert if he would show us his shop because uh, we haven't we heard from Norbert with his chip carving last time around, which was fascinating. I will do that, but first I have to acknowledge that I've become a uh, sort of uh, fanatical with doing small boxes since I took a course from Ernie <laughs> probably 12, 15 years ago. And uh, I haven't looked back since. I'm working on one right now, which I uh, was going to use as a demonstration, but I'm not done with it. But I will show you what I've done. Uh, it's still not finished up. I still have the tenon on the bottom, but it's out of basswood. And uh, so when you look at, look at the base, uh, I'm carving it with chip carving knives. Okay, so. Well, how did you make the flutes? The flutes are done with chip carving knives. So this is what I was uh, discussed the other day, uh, one of the last meetings I was at. So by, by doing the, the angles on this, uh, I cut into chips. And then by doing, uh, if I want to highlight things, if you look at, man, I need to change. You're going to have to hold it still. If you look at, yeah, I'll hold this to look at the top where the flutes meet, and then you have another triangular shape defining the flutes. And that's done with the knife. Uh, and then I do clean it up with a carving tool because it has the right angle and it's, it's smooth enough that I can use one pass to uh, clean the flutes. So that's the inside. It's not finished yet. And the lid? You have a lid for that? And the lid is coming up. So the lid fits on. I still have to do the final touch up on it. But I will also put a finial on top to finish the, finish the whole design. Are you going to chip carve the lid as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. So, so we'll see progress on that. We will two. see progress on this. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Now, so I worked on this yesterday. So let me take my camera off of my laptop here. You, you got to be I'm very gonna... careful about it. You're going to, you're going to, you're going you're to start to break up. So you can go to a new location and be still walking I'm around. Going to, it's not going to work. I'm not, I can't walk far because it's attached to the computer. So I'll give you a pan view. There, that's good. So we let, can, me, yeah. let me know if it works. I have the cable long enough so I can separate things out. No, you've turned just it all sideways. You were better off before. Yeah, just bear with me, bear with me. Okay. No. So, yeah. Okay, so here I am starting off uh, and then going back. There is my American Beauty. I have the extension on it and it's a three horsepower and uh, the tilting uh, end of it, the uh, center, and I want to show you. <laughs> okay, uh, I gotta step back. You, you better put the camera back on steady, yeah. Yeah, I so my turning tools are there, and if I keep panning around, you'll see my sharpening system, but it's not very well defined. But what you see is since I do professional wood carving. There you go. Yeah. Since I do professional wood carving, uh, I have a whole setup for doing my 
carving tools. And, those, uh, those look like buffing wheels. Do you buff the carving tools? I, I do not. They're rubberized wheels. They're called Fischler wheels, and they come from Germany, professional carving wheels. And they are actually honing wheels. They are very, very soft. They have a very low uh, abrasive in them. And they've been used in Europe, uh, in Germany and uh, Austria for years. And uh, so I bought those years and years ago. They were quite expensive then, uh, but I still, I mean, I still have 20, 30 years to go with them. So table saw behind there is a jointer, uh, cabinets uh, in the far corner is my anvil. I mean, my, uh, my big vice. And then when I, go around here, you'll see a big slab of, uh, that is uh, cherry, and I'm going to make a waterfall table with that. Uh, on the, uh, the legs are going to be mahogany, and my drill press, and my cutoff saw, which is on a cabinet I build, the wings fold up and down so that I can use it. Everything is on casters because the shop is 24 by 24, but everything is on casters so that if I need to use larger floor space, I can move the table saw, the joint, everything out of the way. And uh, so the ceiling, raw wood, the ceiling, I also use and stored all my clamps so that they're out of my way. And then in the back is the uh, air filtration system. And the only thing I have to install yet is my dust collection, which sits outside the back door and it'll be separated from the shop. So I don't have the noise in the shop. So that is basically the shop. Here is my temporary computer with the carving bench set up. And just to show you, I have row after row drawer after drawer, about 450 carving tools. And uh, I'll kind of come around here and show you some more carving tools, another cabinet with the big stuff in it. And then I just came back from Florida. So I took my small uh, carving pocket uh, with the tools in it, the, uh, so I can do something in Florida. And then I want to show you, this is my mobile table set up for the lathe. I can roll it around. It has all my functioning equipment in it for the lathe, the attachments and so forth. And then all my uh, immediate need uh, equipment for the lathe. So it's uh, air conditioned shop, it's uh, heated, uh, it's well ventilated. So let me put the camera back. And uh, that... what's the blue cloth laying there? No, I think he's frozen. So that was, what's that? What's the oh blue cloth lying there? Are we okay now? Yeah, we're good. Okay, all right. What, so, what... Okay, a very nice shop tour. I appreciate that. I'm going to skip your question about the blue cloth, Jim, because we got only a few minutes left and a couple more guys. So I'm going to take the spotlight off of Norbert, and I'm going to go to uh, David Campbell. All right, guys. Uh, just want to let you know that, uh, <clears throat> okay, I said earlier, and uh, maybe not all of you were on when I said it. Um, I actually, I don't do wood turning itself. What I do is I make wood lathe accessories. And so far I have two products. Uh, one I started out with was uh, my hollowing system. And uh, I'll, I'm also right now working on a threader. And the, 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 what's unique about my threader is you can actually shift the threads on the fly. So you don't have to pull anything apart to put on a new pitch. And uh, I'm gonna share screen and show you my threader here right now. This is just a prototype. This is not the production model. So I'm going to show it to you here right now. David's in Red Deer, Alberta. Yes. 
where one of my grandfathers, great grandfathers, settled. Actually, he ran a an ironworks that fixed railroad cars back in the turn of the century of the nineteenth century. Okay, can everybody see it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's uh, this is uh, one part of it. So tell, tell us what we're looking at there. Describe, uh, we, I see uh, tubular ways and a, a, a dewey with a crank wheel on it. What do we got here? Yep. Okay, so basically that crank wheel, you put the, obviously you put the chuck on the end and you just crank it in to whatever pitch that, that you're using. And that little wheel on the end is actually your shifter. So you can actually shift between four pitches on this uh, unit. So this basically, will cut, we, this will cut mating threads in the box body and lid, for example. Yep, exactly. Yep. Yep. So it's and, just a matter of uh, so instead of like I say, instead of having to change it all out, uh, all you got to do is turn the knob to your next uh, whatever whichever thread you choose to cut. And are you going to manufacture this for sale? Yes, I am. Yep. And where are you going to sell that through? Well, I'm just selling. Going to sell it through my website and local for now. And what kind of pricing will that have on it? Uh, right now, it's gonna it's, it's kind of volatile because of the price of materials, and we all know where, where that's going these days. But uh, but for now, I'm gonna go with the price of about 750. That would be Canadian dollars. Canadian dollars, yeah. So that would be about 600 U.S. dollars. Uh, there, boats, yep. yep. Yeah. Now, do you use a fly cutter on the uh, uh, headstock to cut the thread? Then. Yes, that, and that all comes with it. Yeah, it'll be a, it'll be a call it system. It, it, you know, you you get some that uh, that kind of have the uh, that kind of has the sleeve and the color and the cutter just fits right into the sleeve. Uh, mine is going to be an actual call it. So you can you if you want it, you can change out the call it. If you if you had like a smaller shank size, you can you can change it out. Well, I made it. I made an apparatus like that using an XY uh, drill press of vise and, and, and threaded rod, inch, inch diameter threaded rod. I could never get it accurate enough. I could never get the slop out of it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I found a way to get the slop out of mine. <laughs> I'm still, it's still a work in progress. I'm still, still ironing out a few things, but uh, basically it works pretty well. Right. So are you using like half nuts with ball bearings in them to like a swiss jig borer would use uh for for stability i'm just going to be using uh, bearings so i'm going to use a bearing on each side of the way to, to on each way to just kind of uh, uh keep stability yeah but what about the backlash in your lead screw oh uh yeah there is no backlash it's it's been pretty steady so far all right yeah okay all right yep thank you very much david all right I'm going to take the spotlight off you, and uh, I think we've got Stu Bremner still has his hand up here. you got a couple minutes here, Stu. What do you got? Yeah. Okay. I've got a piece of uh, yellow cedar burl that I had picked up from a brother-in-law that came out of northern Vancouver Island. I turned this a couple of years ago, but what I uh, brought to my attention to show you today was that uh, a couple of weeks ago, you had a fellow talking about a color change in some wood. So... I want to show you this as a some color change. Wow. When I sprayed this with clear lacquer, this is what I got. It came up red. It's a very bright red. And you think this is Western red cedar, do you? Yes. No, it's yellow cedar. Yellow cedar. Yeah. Now, I cored this, and I, I got two, three cores out of it. But this is the natural color with it. Huh. So what do you think the red's from? It's just the pigment in the in, in the wood in it, and it um, reacted with the lacquer that I used. I had a, a, a lacquer that I bought from a local uh, s supply store that I buy, uh, buy my sandpaper from. They, they mix paint and lacquers and you know, lots of finishes, and they do their own. Anyway, uh, that's the lacquer that I used, and it was fine. Now with this other ball, that's the core from it. It's exactly the same piece of wood. It came from inside here. That's the lacquer that I used from, from Bel Air. This is a different brand of lacquer. And it come out clear, just exactly what the wood looks like. Huh. So which brand is the one you would be recommending that comes up clear? 
I don't know. I really like the red. <laughs> <laughs> this demo just, I think it's beautiful. It's stunning colors. So, Stu, you're in the same camp as uh, Bowman. You like to turn wood with lots of holes and cracks in, in it, as opposed to yes, I do. Yeah. Some of us who like to turn perfect wood, we wouldn't. I would never fool around with that. Too too complicated. For Probably wouldn't. Yeah, and I, I just uh, while I'm on here too, I just like to make a comment for Jim, the fellow that had that problem with that that uh, separation of that bowl when it came apart. He was taking the taking the foot off. Uh, just an idea to to do. Uh, uh, a support piece on the on the top side of the of the ball off the tailstock. Use a uh, I, I use a piece of wood with a piece of styrofoam glued to it, and you form that to the space to the shape of the ball or platter that you're using, and butt that up against the the plate while it's turning, and then you can turn the backside right off almost to about a half an inch thick and then just knock that off instead of trying to knock the whole thing off. Uh, and he's, you know, if he doesn't have a vacuum chuck, that's, that's another good way of taking that off. Okay. So, I don't know if you picked up anything from that, but uh, yeah. so. any questions for Stu? I'm going to go I'm going to take the spotlight off you and I'm going to go back to a gallery view now, if I can. Yeah, there we go. Okay, we're at the end of the hour, but if there's any questions for Stu or for anybody else who's shown us stuff today, now's, now's your moment. All right. Thank you all for another uh, very entertaining hour. Uh, Fast-paced, entertaining Thank hour. You. We saw a lot of work today. Very enjoyable. And we'll be back next week, same time, same same, uh, same, log, same link, actually, but I'll send it to you again anyhow. Um, I'll be posting the Thank video in a day or two along with the accumulated chat. There's a nice long chat here today. Thanks very much. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I got a present once for finding the, the golden mean. Maybe you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, there you yes. are. Just, it's like a, yeah. Yeah, it's built in. Just pull them apart and then you get the, the golden mean all the time. Ah, it's nice. also got, um, oh, sorry, where is that? Here. You can You're put a, a pencil in there. You can use it as a, a compass as well. Yeah. That looks like something that would be pretty easy to make. Yeah, actually, this one is homemade. Um, by someone who worked aluminum and made it from uh, out of aluminum, but you can make a wooden version as well, I guess. Yeah. I bought one on the internet, and it and I I had a learning. The ladies use them to determine the size of their eyeshadow. You go on go online. I I wanted a cheap one just for the fun of it, and it came with all these instructions about. Making your eyeshadow correct size. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> okay then. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good for only small objects then. If if that, it's a, a small that's one. That's right. Yeah, it's only good for small stuff. That's what I had a small lathe. Wood shop. Thank God for wood.